Okay, let's continue. So last time, remember we defined the radius of convergence. So first, we have definition. Let's re recall what we had. This is definition of a radius of a convergence. When the disk is smaller, with radius smaller than this capital R, it is uh, uh, absolutely convergent. When it's outside of the radius R, it is going to be divergent. Okay? Mm. And then we have a computational formula for some cases. So if this limit exists, this radius of convergence is equal to the limit of the ops value of uh, an over an plus one. So this is a certain computational formula. And uh, with the help of this formula, we know that this series, this series and from zero to infinity has r equal to infinity. The radius of convergence is infinite, which means it is convergent at every complex numbers. And then we give it a name we call it exponential function of z, complex exponential function, or we just simply write e to z. Okay, so that's what we did last time, the exponential function. And okay, now let's continue. Follow the standard discussion of a series, we have this proposition, proposition 1.5. 1.5 says, let A and B and B2 absolutely convergent series. B2 absolutely convergent series and we put Cn to be the sigma k from 0 to n a k b n minus k Cn n is here n is here we have 3 n k is from 0 to n okay then The new series Cn, so here you compute each term and then you add all of them. The new series Cn is absolutely convergent with the sum with the value series An times the series Bn. Basically, this proposition tells us for two absolute, absolutely convergent series, you can compute the product of them as another new series, and this new series has term like this. If you expand it, you will see that's just pointwise computation uh, multiplication. In this proposition, you can find the proof in whatever textbook about the series. So uh, in this book, there's no proof. There's no proof for this. Okay, so you, you can try it by yourself. You don't if you don't know how to prove it, just look for whatever textbook about the series, you can always have them. Uh, well, with the help of this proposition, we have the application of this proposition, which, say, which is about the power series. Okay, so here is general series, whatever series, they are numbers. Now let's have a power series. Let a n times z minus a to nth power, and the series b n, b, b, b n times z minus a to nth power. So those two power series must have the, the same center. You can only do product when those two power series have the same center. B power series ways
radius of convergence greater than or equal to r greater than zero. So this condition actually means, you see, you possibly have point A here. For the first power series, maybe the radius of convergence is this. This is Ra. For the second power series, maybe the radius of convergence is Rb, a slightly bigger, whatever, it's slightly bigger. And now this R is going to be smaller than Ra and smaller than Rb. So possibly we only discuss the disk like this, the common part, the overlapped part, okay? So that the both power series converge absolutely. Okay, so that's what it means. Okay, then put, so we're going to discuss the, the product of two power series. To discuss the power series, we need to determine the coefficient. So put C and B be exactly like this. Sigma K from K from zero to N, A K, B N minus K. This formula, the same formula, A K, B N minus K. Then the conclusion says then both power series What are both power series? It's like this. The first power series times second power series. This is one power series. And power series is Cn, Z minus A to nth power. These two power series have radius of convergence greater than or equal to r, which means at least inside of this overlapped part, both converges, absolutely. And, and, The sum to read up sum is point wise sum, term by term by term sum. Oh, this one is easy to understand. So sum is term by term sum, and the, the product. This is z minus a to nth power. Is term by term product, in fact. Okay, for what? You have to only discuss both convergent power series over the convergent disk for z minus a absolute value less than r. Only inside of the conversion region you can discuss it. Okay, so this is uh, the application of the, uh, of the previous proposition. The proof is not difficult, so you can try to uh, see the proof by yourself, by yourself. So we are not going to give the detailed proof. This is a uh, uh, not in the main part of this class. Uh, but so you can try to prove, try to write down your own proof. The textbook provides an outline, but you can try to uh, write down your detailed proof. Okay, so well, on page 33, there's list of exercises. So the exercise two is to ask you to write down the complete proof to prove this uh, proposition 1.6. You can try it. Uh, it's just a word of uh, uh, epsilon delta and uh, stuff. And then uh, I 
want you to practice three. It's about lim soup, lim im. This is not that uh, uh, simple notation. You possibly only see this first time. So try to prove problem three. And the problem four, it is also about the lim soup, lim im, and the problem five. Problem three, four, five. They are uh, theoretical results about the limb soup and the limb inf. Okay, so okay, so this is a section one, section one power series, and with those three exercises. And now let's try to do section two. Section two, we start to discuss analytic functions. analytic functions okay so first we're going to start to define analytic function but before that we need the differentiability you will see that this differentiability is totally identical to the uh, derivative in a calculus so if G is an open set in C and F from G to C then F is differentiable at a point let's see which word A in G so point A in G if this limit limit H approach to zero F of A plus H minus F of A over H uh, well be careful here H approach to zero this H is a complex number H is a complex number okay so it is two dimensional. It can it can approach zero from whatever direction with whatever trace. It's not just a single segments, ray stuff. Okay, if this li limit exists, if the limit exists, we say functions are differentiable, and the value of this limit. is denoted by f prime of a so the derivative of f at a the derivative of f at point a okay well if this is a differentiability at a point. If f is differentiable at each point, of g, so at every point of g function is differentiable, we say that f is differentiable on g so it's differentiable on an open set again we only discuss the differentiability over open set okay so if this happens at every point each point of g function is differentiable then this uh, in this case, f prime of a, the derivative of f at a, f prime of a defines a function we write like f prime from g to c, f prime from g to c, all right? 
it's like the, the calculus. So we have the derivative function if f is differentiable at each point of g. And if f prime function is continuous, if your new function, derivative function is continuous, we say that f is continuously differentiable. Continuously differentiable. Continuously means uh, the derivative is continuous. Okay? Continuously differentiable. And if f prime itself as a new fu as a function is differentiable then f is called is called twice differentiable you can have twice differentiable and three times differentiable four times differentiable and continue continuing we can have infinitely differentiable infinitely differentiable functions just can be differentiated once, 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 again, 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 infinitely many times. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the name. So we have several names, differentiable, differentiable over G, and continuously differentiable, and, uh, and infinitely differentiable function infinitely differentiable function. All right. So as usual, we know that the differentiable function is always continuous for in, in a calculus. So here we have the same result. The proposition 2.2, .2, it says if f from g to c is differentiable, at a point A in G, then F is continuous at A. So why we bother uh, repeat the, the, the proof? It's because the result we learned was in the Calculus is a real line, the real numbers. So for the real numbers, there's, on, there, there's only two directions, left side, the right side, the continuity. The left limit is equal to the right limit is equal to the value, then it's a continuous. But here we're talking about the complex plane. The complex plane itself is two-dimensional. Whenever you talk about the diff continuity, it's already very complex, very complex, right? So I it may or may not have the same result. But fortunately, for this proposition, you will have the same result. Okay? Uh, well, remember that to show the function is continuous, in principle, we need to show this. The limit of f, is, uh, f at a is, uh, uh, is f a. Well, it's equivalent to show that the difference becomes zero. The difference becomes zero. And also, this is equivalent to, whenever you want to show something is equal to zero, it's equivalent to, to prove the absolute value is zero. Only zero 
has such property. Only zero has such property. If you put a one here, the difference is a one. It's not equivalent to the ups value is one. Okay, remember that, we all know that. Okay, so this is a, uh, that special property for zero. So we are going to show this, and then we're back to the continuity. Proof. Uh, well, let's try to compute. All right, and this one we're going to We're going to divide and multiply the f, f z minus f a divided by z minus a and multiplied by z minus a ups value. So you still have the same thing. And we know that the The limit exists, this is one direction. This implies the limit of the ups value exists. This one way, it's not equivalent. Okay, the limit of, the, uh, of this ratio exists. It implies the limit of ups value, absolute value of this ratio is, exists. And z minus a with ups value, of course, it has a limit, zero at a. So because of this and the product rule of the limit, so we can get we get this right. Okay, and this one is uh, ups value. This limit is ups value of f prime of a. It's not f f prime of a. It's ups value of f prime of a. In the textbook, uh, it's a it's a typo. It's a miss miss error. It's a print, misprint. Uh, and this one is zero. So the product is still zero. Okay, the product is zero. The product is zero means that the limit of ups value fz minus fa is zero and it's equivalent to the function f continuous at a. Right? So this is a, uh, the proof for the uh, complex differentiability imply uh, continuity, complex continuity. Okay? It's not difficult, but you have to understand or understand the, the, the idea or the rhythm behind the steps. Okay, now we have more or less the enough argument before we mention the definition of analytic function. Okay, a function f from g to c is analytic if f is continuously differentiable. At a. Continuously differentiable at a. Okay? So this is uh, the definition of analytical function. It has to be differentiable, differentiable, and the derivative should be continuous. The derivative should be continuous. And, uh, it, and then you can develop the property of the uh, derivatives, analyticity, stuffs. You can see that the dif because the differentiability, uh, di the derivative definition is identical to the to the calculus derivative. So we will naturally have the sum rule 
difference rule product rule and the quotient rule of course when you apply quotient to the denominator should not be zero in case uh, g is not, uh, is not zero okay so if f and g are analytic then you will see that f prime is continuous, g prime is continuous, sum or difference is still continuous. So we get f plus g is analytic, or f minus g is analytic. f and g are both analytic, then f prime, g prime, g, f, they are both, they are always continuous, so the, the, the combination is continuous. So, so, and similar thing for, uh, work for the uh, quotient. So we can get the sum difference product in the quotient of analytic functions are analytic. Okay? If you already have analytic functions, you do some difference product quotient, you still get analytic functions. Uh, only for the denominator should be a little bit careful, you cannot allow the zero denominator. That. Right? And uh, because we know the continuous function, uh, sorry, z. Function z is analytic then you can get all the uh, polynomials are analytic. And then you take the ratio, get all the rational functions analytic. All rational functions are analytic on their domain. Right? All the analytic functions, uh, all the rational functions will be analytic on the domains. Okay. Uh, one more thing we want to verify or we want to check is the chain rule. This is an arithmetic operation, chain rule is not. It's not covered by this. Chain rule is a little bit complex, right? So let's verify chain rule also works for this case. So let F and G be analytic. And omega. F is analytic on G, uh, uh, capital G. G is analytic on omega, respectively. And suppose f of g is containing omega, then g circle f is analytic on g, and we have the chain rule, g circle f prime evaluated at z is g prime evaluated at f of z times f prime of z for all z in g, all z in g. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the chain rule. Right, and we are going to prove the chain rule. To prove the chain rule, How do we prove the chain rule? You see here, we are technically working on something like this. So, uh, G, F, Z, G, F, A over Z minus A. So we're trying to compute this. Uh, to compute this, Technically, we do this trick. We 
do this trick. Right, we do this trick. We we just insert the de uh, denominator f z minus f v and enumerate f z minus f a. So, roughly speaking, this will give us g prime of f a. This will give you f prime of a. So well done. But remember that whenever you insert a denominator, you have to make sure that this denominator is not zero. So possibly when z approaches a uh, for a lot of value of z f of z is equal to f of a this denominator becomes zero so your argument does not work right so that's a technical uh, problem so we're trying to avoid that technical problem in that process we figure out it's easy to study sequence it's easy to study sequence instead of a uh, general limit so we have the following uh, proof okay to to tell the difference be, uh, to tell the connection between the sequence and the and the limit you have the following thing so the limit z approaches a f z is f a the limit is this value if and only if for any sequence Zn with limit n approaches infinity, Zn equal to a. So it's like the, you, you get a sample. We have the limit n approaches infinity, f of Zn is equal to f of a. Okay? So you have to check all the possible sequences, all possible sequences. That's enough. Then, then you can claim uh, it is e it, it, you get the limit of function at a point is equal to f a. Okay, this is a limit property. Uh, so now let's see the the proof. The proof is the following. So we fixed z zero in G. We fix a point in G and choose. a positive number R such that the ball centered at Z0 with the radius R is totally contingent G. So we're talking about an interior point, right? G is open, so it's an interior point. We must require G to be open. Okay, and then we're going to let Zn approach A. Zn approach A. Zn minus A will approach 0. So this difference will be called H0. We choose for, for any Hn with first h n up value less than r the difference should be small enough and second the limit of h n is zero as n approaches infinity okay so we're trying to find all possible sequences for any h n we show that this limit is equal to the uh, the product. We show that the limit n approaches infinity g f z zero plus h n minus g f z zero over h n is equal to g prime of f of z zero f prime of z zero. So we're going to cho cho show this way. Okay, so remember that we had a, a, a small issue. If this is zero, if this difference is zero, you cannot do that division. So now let's talk about the nice case if it's never zero. So case one. K 
case one, suppose f of z0 plus hn is never equal to f of z0 for all n. If this is if this denominator is always non-zero, in this case, perfect, right? Perfect. We have we have this decomposition. This uh, g f z zero plus h n minus g f z zero over h n is equal to f z zero h n g f z zero f z zero h n f z zero we insert this f z zero h n f z zero h n right we insert and we know that oh z z zero my bad z zero plus h n because h n approaches zero h n approaches zero so f of z zero plus h n is equal to f z zero this com approaches zero because f is continuous so this first limit will will be g prime second limit will be f prime we have the limit and approaches infinity g f z zero plus h n minus g f z zero over h n is equal to g prime f z zero f prime of z zero okay this this is a nice case nice case our logic works there's no tricks okay uh now let's talk about the the dirty work uh well sometimes it works sometimes it does not work so h n we divide the sequence hn into two parts uh, kn uni ln separately separately such that fzn plus kn is never equal to fzn so it still has uh, this sequence hn still ha has a, a good part for all n and fz0 plus ln is always equal to fz0 for all n for bad part so it's I isolate the the constant subsequence we call it the the sequence ln okay and remember this ln is part of our hn it's infinite so ln as n approaches infinity ln is also zero hn approaches zero subsequence will also approach zero right okay so it's very important and it's it's a sequence approaching zero then let's check f prime of a what is f prime uh, not a z z n z zero f prime of z zero this is letter z minus f of z zero over h this is the definition once it exists, you don't have to pick up all possible small h. You can just choose sequence. So it's equal to f of z0 plus ln minus f of z0 over ln. Okay? 
ln uh, is uh, approaching zero. But now you can see that f of z0 plus ln is f of z0. So the numerator is constantly zero for this selection. So this, the derivative in this case must be zero. The derivative of f at z0 must be zero. Okay, keep this in mind. This is a one of the property we are going to apply. Okay, now let's see. We have two parts. We divide this sequence Hn into two parts, Kn and Ln. Now we're talking about Ln. To talk about Ln, we know f prime of uh, uh, z0 is 0. And here, here, g of f of z0 plus Ln minus g of f of z0. f of z0 plus Ln is equal to f of z0. So this numerator. If you write one more step, you will realize that This numerator is, is always zero, so this pro, this limit is zero. This limit is constantly zero. It is a constant at zero. It's like the g compose f prime evaluated at z zero. It's constantly zero. And the other the other side the other side the g prime of f of z zero times f prime of z zero. I don't care what this value is. It is some complex number. But I know this quantity is zero. So the product is equal to the left hand side. They are both equal to zero. They are both equal to zero. OK, so this is uh, uh, the situation when you handle the L part. For the Km part, for the Km part, which is the subsequence of Hn, with uh, f of z0 plus Km is never equal to f of z0 for all n. Well, this is just another another phase for Hn in the first case. By case one. we can see that this limit this limit g f z0 kn minus g f z0 over kn is going to equal to prime z0 and f prime of z0. Well, this is already done in case one, right? OK, so but here, this what is this product? This product is 0. This product is equal to 0, because here, this one is 0. So you divide a sequence. into two subsequences. Over each subsequence, the limit is 0. So over the total sequence, uh, well, not the limit equal to 0, limit equal to each other. Total sequence. They should equal to 0. And of course, this 0 is is also equal to this quantity. In this case, it's both they both equal to this. Right? So that's a finish the proof. So we do get the uh, the case.
in the second case, in the second case, we not just know the equal to each other, we also know the equal to what value. In the first case, we don't know what the, what the value is. It's, we just know the value is the product, those two numbers. They could be 11, it could be 100, or whatever way. Right? Okay, cool. So we prove the chain rule. This proof works for complex case. It also works for the real case. Uh, in the whole stuff, you can see that we do require the domain of f to be open. So analytic functions are defined to be on open sets. If your set is not open and you still talk about analytic functions, if A is not open, then any analytic function defined on A means this function, this analytic function is defined on an open set containing A. So for example, if you have a triangle, close the triangle with, with the interior part, this is A. Then you say, okay, I have an analytic function defined over this triangle. Basically, in your mind or in your words, you mean you're going to have certain open set. This function is defined over the whole open set and, and analytic over the whole open set. You kind of... Uh, expand this set a little bit. The analytic function can only be defined over the open set. If not open, make it large. It still need to be open. Okay? Okay, very good. So we finish this video at this moment and we will continue the lecture in the next video. Okay? The lecture is not done. Thank you.